All right. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, should I do it this way? Okay. And uh, and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some work that I've been doing with my students, mostly uh, Yang Song, Xin Jia Zhao, and also Sahaj Kar. And uh, it's gonna be on a new kind of generative model that we've been exploring uh, over the last year or so. So uh, let's start with some background. Uh, as you probably know, there's been a lot of progress in uh, building generative models of complex objects like images, text, uh, video, music, uh, graph molecules, and so forth. Uh, here you can see some examples of the kinds of images you can generate. Uh, using uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks. These are synthesized images by, by one of these models and they look uh, very much uh, realistic, even though they are generated by a, by a model that has been learned on data. And uh, similarly, if we think about other modalities, there's been a lot of progress in, in natural language processes, it processing uh, using um, generative models. Uh, this day, it has become pretty standard to pre-train um, models for many kinds of NLP tasks uh, using uh, representations learned by a language model, which is just a generative model uh, of text trained over huge uh, corpora of, uh, of unlabeled text. And uh, these models, they work reasonably well. Uh, here I try to play around with the uh, one of the publicly available transformer, GPT-2 implementations. And uh, you, you can provide that sentence and the, the, the generative model will try to complete it based on a statistical model of what uh, natural language, natural English language looks like. And so I started a sentence with the generative models cannot and uh, the completion I got is uh, be considered to be an adequate representation of reality. So that's, it's pretty cool. Um, they, they seem to uh, be able to get some understanding of uh, uh, of natural language and uh, these representations indeed are extremely useful across a variety of NLP tasks. Now uh, more generally uh, I'm personally interested in, in generative models exactly because of this because represents a very natural way to think about uh, in, a, in a principled way, in a probabilistic way about unsupervised learning uh, they are a way to try to identify structure in unlabeled data, whether it's images, text, uh, more broadly, it could be satellite images, videos. And I think it's a very promising way to go beyond this, this idea of training supervised models using lots of labeled data. Perhaps we can do something better by leveraging unlabeled data, find out what's the underlying structure, identify features, and then use them to improve uh, performance the same way uh, we've, been, we've seen has been so successful in the natural language process. So uh, now there are kind of like two main uh, classes of generative models. Uh, the first one are implicit models like generative adversarial networks that we've seen before. Uh, here the idea is that we're going to represent uh, the sampling process itself. For example, uh, we might have something like uh, again where the idea is that we start with some simple random noise, maybe from a Gaussian distribution, epsilon, and we transform it uh, using some function, maybe represented by a neural network, into a sample. For example, an image of a, of a digit or the kind of like amazing images I showed you before. And so the model here, here basically represents directly this procedure that is used to transform some simple source of noise into a sample. And uh, these models, they work uh, quite well, but one challenge is that uh, the, the uh, probability distribution over the outputs uh, that they generate uh, is often intractable. And uh, as a result, uh, they can be difficult to train. Uh, we don't have access to some uh, likelihood, which means that we cannot train them uh, via maximum likelihood. And uh, we have to train them using uh, some kind of like minimax, uh, optimization problem where we train this generator function to produce samples that are difficult to distinguish from the training data uh, using an external uh, discriminator. And this kind of like minimax procedure can be uh, 
difficult to, 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 to optimize well, um, they might not converge. There are all kinds of issues that arise because of the fact that we're not using uh, maximum likelihood, a well understood you know, like statistical approach to train this kind of models. So another class of models that are more um, uh, perhaps more familiar with, uh, with, uh, with everybody are explicit probability generative models, where the, the idea is that instead of representing the sampling process, uh, the model uh, works directly by representing a probability mass function or a probability density. And uh, uh, there are many examples of over the objects that we need to generate. For example, we can call it P of X, and then P of X should be some kind of, let's say, a probability mass functions where X could range over all possible images. And if you have a good model of the data, then it should be the case that P of X assigns high probability to uh, vectors axes that correspond to that are similar to that to the training set to, to let's say natural images or or uh, well-formed English sentences if you are thinking about text and uh, there are many ways to represent this kind of complex objects uh, there are classic approaches based on graphical models like Bayesian networks and directed graphical models and those more modern approaches that combine these kind of ideas with neural networks like our progressive models, flow models, and so forth. Now, the, the key advantage is that you have access to a uh, uh, probability uh, mass function or a probability density function, which means that uh, we can, in principle, train them uh, via maximum likelihood, uh, which is something we understand. It's at the end of the day, it's compression, so we can compare models. That we inherit all the nice properties of uh, maximum likelihood learning. Uh, the challenge is that these objects are complicated. Uh, in particular, uh, we need to, uh, this P of X cannot be an arbitrary function. Uh, if we want it to be a probability mass function or a probability density function, it has to integrate to one, it has to be no negative. And so we cannot just plug in any sort of like neural network to represent this function. Uh, because it has to satisfy these kind of constraints. It has to be normalized in particular. That's a particularly challenging one to deal with. And so there's all, often this kind of like trade-off between uh, being able to uh, define a P of X that is tractable, for which we can evaluate the likelihood efficiently, we can optimize the likelihood as a function of the parameters. Uh, but at the same time, it should be expressive. We should be able to capture uh, complicated uh, distributions with lots of modes because the kind of data sets, the kind of data generating processes that we want to that we want to model are often very complicated. And so, uh, what I will do in this talk is I will uh, discuss a different approach of representing a generative model, where instead of working uh, with a probability density function, uh, we're going to work with its gradient. And here, the gradient is with respect uh, to the input dimensions x. Uh, so this object is called the score, and uh, just to be clear, this is not uh, the gradient of the probability density function with respect to the model parameters. This is a gradient with respect to the input dimensions. So just to get some intuition about what this object looks like, uh, we can think about a simple two-dimensional case. Uh, let's say that the density here in, in this talk, I'm always going to consider uh, continuous random variables, so probability density functions. Uh, let's say that we have a very simple density P of X, uh, which is just a mixture of two Gaussians um, in the top right and bottom left corner. Uh, what is the score? Well, the score is a vector field of gradients. Uh, in any point X, uh, we can look at what is the gradient of log P of X. Uh, that's basically just a vector that will tell us in which direction uh, we should move if we want to increase uh, the likelihood as much as possible. So it will look like this vector field that is kind of like pointing uh, towards the two modes of the, of the underlying distribution. Right. Uh, and so in some sense, uh, the gradient and the, and the density, they are, they are of course uh, very much related to each other. And uh, so if you like analogies with physics, this is kind of like thinking um, about uh, an electric field uh, when we're trying to think about how to model the relationship between two, two charges instead of an electric potential. 
Uh, these two things are kind of related to each other. They are sort of like the same thing, uh, but in some cases it might be helpful to, to work with a field instead of a potential. And indeed, we'll see that that is the case also for, for machine learning applications. There are a number of situations where I'll try to argue uh, it might be beneficial to work uh, with scores instead of probability density functions. Uh, one example is that, uh, as we discussed before, one issue with uh, probability density functions is that these objects are normalized, meaning that you, know, you should figure out, you should always use a class of models such that no matter how you choose the parameters, if you integrate px over all possible values of x, you get one, right? And so if you have a mixture of two Gaussians, you can change the mean, maybe you can change the standard deviations, but sort of like no matter what you do, the integral should be one. So there are some constraints on what is the functional form of p of x that you can use. On the other hand, if you look at the gradient of, the, of this distribution, then that can basically be sort of like an arbitrary function. And so if you're thinking about uh, modeling one of the two, it might be easier to work directly with the gradient, uh, which in this case is just another one dimensional function as opposed to the, to the density directly. Can I just uh, insert a question? I mean, so when yeah, you call, sure. usually what we call score in statistics is the, are the gradients with respect to the parameters of the model. Yes. The, the gradients with respect to the examples. Yes, yes. So it's a different thing. So this is not uh, the reason. Uh, the reason is that this is uh, the, the, this this term. I didn't come up with this terminology. Uh, there is something called score matching, uh, and so which uh, works with scores, and that's how they. That's why they are called scores in that literature. But I agree. Yeah, that can be relatively confusing because if you think about uh, the scores that are typically used in statistics, yeah, that's a gradient with respect to. No, but, but in particular, when you get a sample and you don't have the distribution itself, uh, you need some sort of smoothing of the distribution of, of the empirical distribution in order to actually talk about the scores. Yeah. All right. So well, we'll see what happens when we, when we think about uh, data distributions and how to use these kind of objects for and how to learn. But yeah, uh, that might be a little bit confusing because scores uh, might mean something else, but in this literature, they are called scores. All right, so another uh, possible application of this uh, of scores and, and this kind of like approach uh, is for energy-based models. Um, recall here kind of like the, the general idea is that we would like to define uh, distributions or probability density functions. Uh, that are as flexible as possible. And so uh, one natural way to define a very flexible class of, uh, of functions is to use a kind of like deep neural network. Uh, this deep neural network, we're gonna denote it uh, F theta, and you can think of it as a mapping. It takes X and it maps it to some, which is, which is just a sample and it maps it to, to a real number. Uh, now we know that a probability density has to be no negative and so one thing we can do is we can take an arbitrary neural network, we can take the exponential of that, and uh, that will guarantee that the quantity, uh, the output is gonna be negative. The problem is that uh, the, in order to be a valid PDF, a probability density function has to be normalized, it has to integrate to one. And so in order to do that, we also have to somehow figure out what is the, the integral of this object over the whole space. Uh, this is often called the partition function, which is a normalization constant. Uh, we're gonna denote it uh, z theta here, and you basically have to divide by that number to get a valid PDF. Now, the pros is that these kind of models are very flexible because essentially you can plug in any uh, f theta, any neural network you want. Uh, the challenge is that you have to deal with this partition function z theta, which requires you to integrate over a possibly very high dimensional space, which is generally intractable to compute. And uh, uh, what, what this means is that evaluating uh, a likelihood or a log likelihood under these kind of models is, is intractable because it requires you to evaluate uh, this partition function. If you take the log of that P theta expression there, you're gonna get two terms. You're gonna get basically the output of your neural network, which is easy to evaluate. But then you have to divide, you have to normalize by this partition function, 
uh, which is uh, generally uh, intractable to compute. So if you have some kind of data generating process and you're trying to find the parameters data of your neural network to maximize uh, the, the likelihood of the, of the data, uh, you need to optimize the expression that I have there at the bottom as a function of theta, but evaluating the second term, the log partition function uh, is expensive, and so uh, it's, it's actually difficult uh, to train this kind of model. On the other hand, uh, we can look at what happens if we look at the score uh, of these kind of models. Uh, if we look at the gradient with respect to x of this log likelihood, uh, we see that we get the gradient of, of two terms. Uh, we get the gradient with respect to x of our f theta, our energy, our deep neural network, uh, which is something that we might be able to, to evaluate efficiently. And then we get the gradient with respect to of x of this log partition function, which is just a constant. And so the gradient with respect to x of this term is actually zero. And so we see that although we cannot evaluate uh, the log likelihood efficiently, and so we cannot optimize it as a function of theta efficiently, uh, evaluating its core, uh, which is the gradient with respect to x of the log likelihood, uh, is actually efficient. And so what we can do is we can try to use uh, the score. This is kind of like the idea that, that, that I mentioned at a high level before. Let's try to work directly with the scores instead of working with the, with the log densities. And perhaps we can come up with more efficient algorithms. And so one thing we can try to do is we can try to, instead of training the model using maximum likelihood, we can try to work directly at the level of uh, vector fields of gradients. And uh, if we know that there is some kind of underlying data generating process, big data, that we want to capture using our model, one way to do it, of course, is to minimize scale divergence, which is the same thing as doing maximum likelihood, which is what we were trying to do before. Uh, but another way we can try to, to, to approach this problem is we can try to fit directly these two vector field of scores. Uh, we can try to find uh, uh, there is going to be a true underlying vector field of scores for the data generating process on the left. For any value of theta for your parameters, there's going to be another vector field of scores on the right. And we can try to choose theta so that we can make them uh, as close as possible. And uh, the, the, the advantage of this is that you don't, uh, evaluating the vector field of scores on the right does not require uh, the underlying partition function. And so it might be uh, more computationally uh, efficient. And there are many other applications of this kind of ideas that I'm not gonna go into this talk, uh, like the AEs with implicit encoders, fastest standard encoders, uh, and other. Right, so the, the, the high level idea of the problem we're trying to solve is that there is some underlying data generating process, p data. Here I'm showing it in, in a 2D uh, case just for simplicity. Uh, we get access to a bunch of samples from this data distribution. Uh, this is a training set of samples from this density. And uh, the goal is to basically try to come up with uh, a model for the underlying vector field of, of gradients. And we can think of it as a, as a function from let's say RD to RD, where D is the dimensionality of the data. At any point in space, it will give us a gradient, a, a vector, which is kind of like the direction that we're estimating we should move in if we want to maximize the, uh, where the, in which basically the, the log likelihood grows the most. And uh, the, the, the problem here is that we uh, would like this vector field of gradients that we estimate to be as close as possible to the true uh, underlying vector field of gradients of the, of the data distribution. And of course, the challenge is that we don't know p data, we don't know uh, the gradient with respect to x of log p data. The only thing we have is, is, is the usual learning setting where the only thing we have access to is uh, this thing in the middle of a bunch of samples. And that's the only information that we have about PData. And we need to figure out how to use the samples to come up with this, uh, with this model for the, for, the, for the underlying vector field of gradients. All right, questions on this? Is the, is the setting clear 
I still have a problem with the way you smooth this uh, training data. I mean, without some more, more assumptions in order to actually estimate these scores, I mean, uh, these fields. So you perturb the data a little bit or you do some sort of uh, parametric models of the data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that there's gonna be, uh, it will be basically adding, that we will come to the issues of uh, what if, uh, you know, the data is, is on a manifold, that there's gonna be all kinds of issues that come up uh, and we'll talk about how to, how to make it work in practice. Indeed, it's, it's not so easy, but this is kind of like the underlying idea. Let's work with scores instead of working with, with densities. We'll get much more into the details on how this actually works. All right. All right, so uh, that's formalized a little bit the problem. Uh, we're given a bunch of samples um, drawn IID from an underlying data, data generating process, PData. We don't know PData, we only have access to the samples. And now just for simplicity, I'm gonna call it P of X. Uh, just a little bit shorter. Uh, and uh, the task is to try to estimate this uh, vector field of, of gradients. And uh, in order to do that, we're going to use a model, which is an, as, as before, a vector valid function. At any point in space, it will give us the direction. And uh, the question, the first question is, how do we even compare two vector fields, of course? Uh, these are two pretty complicated objects, and we need to figure out a way to to a metric to see, you know, is our model any good? How close is our score model to the true um, underlying uh, vector field? Right, and so the idea is that there is a true underlying vector field of scores that we actually don't even know. Uh, there is our model, and we sort of like need to figure out whether these two objects are close to each other or not. And uh, one simple way to do it is to basically overlap them. Uh, we can look at every point. What is the difference between uh, our estimated gradient and the true one? And maybe we can take the average of this of their uh, distance over the whole space. And that's a reasonable objective function to compare these two, these two objects. Uh, so we're going to average over the whole space with respect to the data distribution. Uh, the difference between the true score and the estimated one at every, at every point in space. Right? And uh, uh, this is called the Fisher divergence. Uh, and it has good properties uh, if our score is correct, so at any point it gives us the right direction, uh, then the Fisher divergence is zero, and if the Fisher divergence is zero, then the distribution are the same, more or less, uh, which means that it's a reasonable objective to learn a generated model. If we try to use data so that we try to make this Fisher divergence as small as possible, then we are sort of like, and if we're able to achieve this, if we're able to drive this loss to zero, then it means that we've actually learned uh, the perfect model of the, of the true underlying data distribution. Now, the challenge, of course, is that uh, we don't know the X. Uh, recall, we only have access to a bunch of samples. So maybe we can evaluate the expectation using uh, some, uh, just, just Monte Carlo, yeah, just using the, the training set to approximate the, the actual expectation, uh, but there is no way we can evaluate this first term, uh, which is the true underlying uh, gradient of the, of the data density. And uh, so here's the first uh, uh, neat trick. Uh, it turns out that if you do integration by parts, uh, you can simplify this expression uh, into one that does not require that does not involve the true uh, score anymore. And uh, the, the idea is that basically just expand, I'm not showing here the derivation, but if you expand the square, uh, you're gonna end up with a term that does not depend on theta, you're gonna depend, end up with a term which is basically S theta squared, which is kind of like this one, then you end up with a double product, then you apply integration by part to this double product, and uh, you get rid of the dependency on uh, this term and you get something which is basically uh, another derivative of S theta. Uh, 
And so this is kind of like the final expression. Uh, this objective is equivalent up to a constant, which does not depend on theta, to this objective, uh, which basically involves two terms. It's the expectation with respect to P of X of the squared norm of S theta, which is our estimated gradient. And then we have the trace of the Jacobian of S theta. Is there another assumption here that the, the gradients vanish on the boundary or something yes. like that? Yes. Okay. That's the other assumption. Uh, when you do integration by part, basically, uh, there's one term that has to, to go to zero. And uh, this is called score matching, um, was proposed uh, many years ago. And uh, the advantage of this objective is that this is something we can actually approximate using a training set. Uh, we can approximate the expectation using um, our samples. And uh, we get an objective which now does not longer depend on this true score that we didn't know how to evaluate. Basically, all the terms here are uh, manageable. They involve only our model as data. And so, in principle, this is something that we can evaluate uh, and, we can, and we can optimize as a function of data. Uh, quick question. Can you uh, say more about this integration by parts? Why the data part dropped out? Yeah, so basically the, the idea is that, um, so the, the, the annoying piece is basically the double product between this and this. Uh, because this, if you take the square of this, this is just gonna be an independent of theta. And so we can basically ignore it. The square of this uh, is this term here. Uh, then you have the double product of these two terms. Uh, and then uh, let's see, I have it actually here. So let's say that we do it in one dimension just for simplicity. This is what it would look like. Um, we can expand the expectation as an integral. Uh, then uh, we expand the square. We get a term in blue here that does not depend on theta. You can ignore it. You get this term in, in green. Uh, that is something we know how to handle. And then you have this double product here. This is the, the red part that's kind of like the annoying one that still depends on gradient x of log px, which we don't know how to handle. So here uh, is where we use, uh, we can first write the gradient of x of log px. We expand it as one over px times the gradient of px. And now the px cancel here. And so we're left with something like this, which is exactly the kind of uh, expression where you would like to maybe apply integration by parts. And now here is where we're applying integration by parts. Uh, we change the derivative of p times s uh, to the derivative of s times p. And then there is this uh, uh, boundary term, uh, which as mentioned before by Naftali, this is something that we need to assume uh, kind of like goes to zero and it's just sort of like reasonable if it decays sufficiently fast. And uh, now this piece uh, is basically something that we know how to handle. It's, uh, it's uh, again an expectation with respect to the data of the gradient of our model. And so this is again something that we can handle through, we can approximate it's basically an, a, 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 an expectation with respect to P of something that depends on the model in a relatively easy way. And so that's something that we can approximate uh, using a Monte Carlo estimator. Okay, thanks. So the, the complicated, this is kind of like the 1D version and uh, the more complicated, this is basically the multidimensional version of that. And you can see this is kind of like a reasonable objective. What we're saying is we have a bunch of data points. We're trying to find a theta such that the gradient evaluated at those xi's is small. So we're kind of like trying to make them into stationary points. Uh, and at the same time, basically we're trying to, we're looking at the trace of the Jacobian of that. So we're actually trying to make them into, into local maxima. We would like to choose a theta such that the data set, every data, every point in the, in the, in the training set becomes a local maxima of our, of our estimated density. 
That's one intuitive interpretation of this objective. Other questions on this? All right, so let's move on and see how to actually use this. Um, now, let's say that we um, now want to, what, what kind of, what kind of um, models can we use to, to, what kind of function classes can we use to represent this, this S data? One natural choice would be to use some kind of like deep neural network uh, that will take as input X and will map it to the, um, to the corresponding estimated gradient. So this is a vector valued function as data. Here I'm showing a three-dimensional case just for simplicity. Because you want, you know, in general, this could be if you want to model images, this uh, X could be very high dimensional, maybe thousands or even tens of thousands, millions of dimensions. Uh, we need to, in order to evaluate the objective, we need to evaluate two pieces. We need to evaluate the norm of S theta, which is of course relatively easy. You just need to do a forward pass in the network, evaluate the whole thing and take the norm. So evaluating the first term is easy. Uh, the second term is a little bit more complicated. The trace of the Jacobian of S theta uh, is actually a bit more complicated. Uh, the Jacobian is basically the matrix with all the partial derivatives. Uh, to get the trace, we basically need to compute all the terms on the, on the diagonal and we have to sum them up. So the first term basically would be the uh, partial derivative of the first component of the output with respect to x1, with respect to the first input. So to evaluate that, we would have to do a forward pass in the network, evaluate the first output, and then do one backward pass to basically get the partial derivative with respect to S1. To evaluate the second term on the, on the, on the diagonal, we would have to evaluate the second output, evaluate the partial derivative with respect to the second input, and so forth. So naively, uh, this would require uh, order D backpropagations through the, through the network, uh, or this data dimension, and uh, this can be very, very expensive. In practice, it's still linear, maybe the dimensionality is not too bad, uh, but in practice, if you have to do it uh, every, at every training step, uh, this can be extremely expensive. And so uh, we need to figure out a way to, to make this uh, more scalable. And so uh, our solution is to look at a simpler problem. Uh, we know that one dimensional problems should be easier. And so instead of actually comparing the, the, the whole vector field of scores, what we can do is we can look at random projections of these objects. So the intuition is that our original Fisher divergence is kind of like trying to match these two vector field of scores, the true one and the model. If they are the same, then they should also be the same along any random direction. And so what we can do is we can pick a couple of random directions. We can project the two vector fields along these dimensions, and we can try to compare them. We can try to match them. And uh, this is what we called a slide score matching. It's basically the same objective that we had before, except that we now, um, instead of comparing, uh, we're basically now comparing uh, real numbers. For every point, we pick a random direction V based on some distribution. We project the true gradient and the estimated one uh, along that direction V, and then we look at the square distance difference between the two. And uh, just like before, it looks like this expression depends on P data, which uh, we don't know, but if you do integration by parts, it can be reduced uh, back into something that only depends on our model. And uh, this is something we called uh, slice, slice score matching. And uh, it has two advantages. Uh, the first one is that, well, just like before, kind of like the gradient, uh, the, the squared uh, norm is easy to evaluate. 
Uh, but now, basically, the first term, uh, before we had the trace of the Jacobian, we didn't know how to do it. Now, it's basically a Hessian top product, uh, which is something uh, that can be evaluated efficiently with basically two uh, back propagations. Uh, a question. So, so, is this, Stefano, what's the V intended to be? Just yeah. a random projection or? That's a random projection, yes. And uh, you can choose V, uh, that will come up later. What's the right distribution that you should use to choose these directions? It turns out that many distributions work, uh, some are better than others, and it will give you uh, a smaller variance. But yeah, this is V here is the random direction that we're using. I, I see, but you use new random directions as you go along, you, you don't fix them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is the uh, slide score matching objective. And uh, as just like before, uh, you can come up with a finite sample estimator uh, using samples, basically doing a Monte Carlo evaluation of both expectations. Uh, there's some flexibility in choosing the distribution of the random directions. Uh, you could use a multivariate uh, standard normal or you could use a multivariate Rademacher distribution, for example. And it turns out the Rademacher is strictly better. It will give you a smaller variance. So and don't you want something which depends on the data itself? I mean, some, some, for example, the PCA or something of the data or-, or To pick the direction? The vectors that are important in terms of variability or in terms of the class separation. CCA, VIST, yeah. A or something like this. So this is a better choice than just a random Rademacher distribution. Yeah, so um, I have actually a student who is working on exactly that. I'm, I'm trying to find a better direct, better, what kind of like a, adapt PV to the data distribution and kind of like try to find the direction that will give you the most contrast in some sense. Because in high dimension, actually this averaging over V can be very, very heavy. Yeah, uh, all right, yeah. There is definitely, you can improve on this, yeah. Uh, there are other ways to, to, to reduce the, you know, to reduce the variance of this estimator. You can, of course, take more projections, uh, but that will also increase the computational uh, cost of the algorithm. And it turns out you can also analytically integrate some of these, some of these terms, which might or might not reduce uh, the variance of the of the resulting estimator. Uh, this uh, objective, it turns out, it has some good properties. Uh, for any number of random projections, uh, it's consistent under the usual sort of like assumptions, and uh, we can also prove uh, the asymptotic normality of these estimators and uh, work out the, the actual variance of the, of the of this normal distribution for those, for those distributions. So it has some very uh, nice properties uh, that we would like some learning objective to have. Like unlike GANs, uh, this learning objective has some very nice kind of like theoretical properties. Uh, the, the nice thing is that compared to score matching, it scales to very high dimensions. Uh, here's an example of our, of our implementation. Uh, we can see how much it takes to compute the objective and its gradient as a function of the data dimension. And you can see that score matching uh, scales roughly linearly and at some point you run out of memory um, as a function of the dimensionality of the data. While the sliced version uh, or the slice version with variance reduction, it, it's almost constant. And so it's something that you can actually use when X is very high. And uh, it turns out that it works uh, quite well. Uh, this is an experiment, I'm not gonna go into much detail, but uh, we're trying to fit a deep kernel exponential family, which are some kinds of energy-based models. Uh, we use a, a the, the, the featureization of a kernel as the sufficient statistics for the exponential family. And uh, trained on, on various data sets, you can see that 
the result that you get by training via score matching is very close to what you get by training using sliced score matching, which is randomly projected variant. Uh, but slight score matching is basically much more scalable as we've seen before. So this is just to show that uh, you know it, it can work as a drop-in replacement for score matching, and it's much more uh, much more scalable. Uh, all right, so now the, we can go back to the, the to the problem that we started with, which is to learn an actual generative model. So let's say that we have some samples from some data distribution. Uh, we can use score matching, slice score matching, or any of these kind of algorithms to come up with the, an estimate for the underlying vector field of gradient. And then uh, what we can do is we can try to use uh, this vector field of gradients to sample from the distribution. And intuitively, uh, we can think of using uh, this vector field and we can kind of like try to follow this gradient and try to go towards uh, regions with high density. And uh, of course, if you just follow the gradient, that's not quite going to work because you, you know, you're just gonna find, let's say, local optima of the density. Uh, but it turns out that there is a way to use that information to actually produce samples. And uh, the solution is called Langevin Dynamics, which is basically uh, an, an MCMC algorithm to sample from these kind of distributions. And what it does is it basically follows the gradient, uh, but it adds a little bit of noise so that you don't necessarily get stuck in, in, uh, in the local optima, but you're able to explore and you're able to kind of like uh, actually sample from the, from the underlying distribution. So the, the, the algorithm is this, uh, if you uh, want to sample from Px using an estimate of, of the score, uh, what you do is you initialize x somehow, just like in any MCMC algorithm. And then what you do is you basically follow the perturbed gradient. So at every step, you uh, take a step in the direction of the gradient, which is estimated, let's say, using score matching. And then you add a little bit of Gaussian noise. This is to basically add a little bit of exploration so that you don't just get stuck into some local optimum. And under some conditions, you can show that this will actually produce samples from the from the underlying distribution P of X. And the key advantage is that you only need the gradient, right? And so that's the only information that we have about PX is this vector field of scores, is this idea of looking at the, uh, yeah, at the gradient instead of looking at the density. But if you use this kind of sampling algorithm, that's all you need in order to be able to generate new samples, which is typically what you would want. And so uh, that's kind of like the pipeline. You use some data to come up with an estimate of the gradient, and then you use Langevin dynamics to sample from it and produce, uh, let's say, new images, if that's what you are trying to model. Now, the challenge uh, is that this is not quite going to work. Uh, as, I, as, as I promised, uh, I, will, I will now go into uh, what actually happens in practice if you try to use this kind of this kind of approach? One issue that was alluded before in one of the questions is that uh, in many cases uh, it's reasonable to assume that the data lies or approximately lies on some low-dimensional manifold. And what happens in that case is that uh, the data score uh, in the ambient dimension is not even well defined. And uh, the intuition is that you can think of, let's say the data kind of like lies on a ring. And uh, you can think about what happens if you start making the ring thinner and thinner um, until it becomes just a one dimensional kind of like manifold in a two dimensional space. If you think about what happens is that the gradients will become bigger and bigger and they'll try to push you more and more as the, the density becomes more and more concentrated on the rings, this gradient is going to become bigger and bigger in, in magnitude and kind of like intuitively in the limit, these, these gradients are not even well defined. So that's a problem. Uh, and just to convince you that indeed uh, that is kind of like approximately true in practice, uh, this is well known, but just as a, just as a reminder, if you take uh, MNIST and you just, uh, let's say, look at a 
PCA projection with, let's say, 595 dimensions, uh, you see, you know, if you, if you take a data point and you project it onto that uh, using the first 595 um, uh, eigenvectors, you see that basically there is no difference. At least I cannot perceive any difference between the data point and its projection on this on this linear manifold of 595 dimensions. So and how many? Well, what was the dimension, the effective dimension was from 7, 800, 78, 700 to 600? I use, yeah, I use 600, you, I mean, you can go even, even, this is something I really couldn't tell any difference. You can go even, even, even lower and yeah, you can barely see any difference. Now, if you go to the MNIST data, so we know that, thing. we know that something like 10 dimensions should be enough, I mean, uh, yeah. actually. This is, I really wanted it to be very, very close, uh, so that the, even in, uh, in L infinity norm, the difference is very, very small. And similarly for CIFAR, if you look at the projection, the, the original Im the images are like 3,000 dimensional. If you take 2,000 projection on, on 2,000 dimensions, they are, there is no difference, at least that I can perceive. And so this is kind of like supporting this, this notion that, yeah, I mean, approximately these data sets actually do lie on some kind of like low dimensional manifold, um, probably much lower dimensional than this, because this is kind of like just looking at linear manifolds. In practice, the effective dimension is probably much lower than this. And so that's going to be a problem when we think about our uh, vector field of gradients, because they might not be uh, well defined, which I think is what was initially kind of like uh, the, the issue that was raised uh, at the beginning of the talk, right? And indeed, uh, if you try to do uh, just just in practice, you try to use slice score matching on C410, and you're going to see that the, the the learning is very very unstable. Uh, it keeps bouncing up and down, and it doesn't really learn much. Um, that's not the only issue. Uh, the other issue uh, is that. If you look at this uh, objective that we use uh, when we do score matching, it involves an expectation with respect to the data density. And so we can kind of think of this process uh, as something that looks like this. Uh, the teacher is kind of like providing us samples from the data density, and we use these samples to kind of like learn what is the underlying vector field of gradients. Uh, but what happens is that most of the samples that we get uh, will be kind of like close to the modes of the data density, right? So kind of like you can think of this process is when we get a sample and you kind of try to get a sense of what is the, the underlying gradient around that point, and we can get a rough sense of what's the, uh, what's the, uh, the, the true underlying vector field, right? But as you can see from this picture, kind of like what happens is that most of the samples are going to be close to the modes and uh, we don't get any samples far away from the modes or we get very few and so although in principle this works in practice uh, the score estimation is going to be very inaccurate when you're far away from the high density regions of the of the data and you can see it here is in, in practice with that toy to the uh, mixture of gaussian example uh, the first plot is the true density, true data density. The second plot is the true uh, field of scores. And the third is the one estimated by score matching. And you can see that it's fairly accurate in the box regions, in the red the box regions, uh, but it becomes fairly inaccurate when you're far away from the modes. Kind of like the, the, the arrows, they point in the wrong direction. And what this means is that if you're trying to follow those arrows using your Langevin dynamics, for example, you're going to end up in the wrong spot. And so that's another issue that we need to solve. Uh, the third issue is that uh, Langevin dynamics might not necessarily mix, or it might take forever to mix. And you can kind of see it from this toy example here. Uh, let's say that the data density is, is a mixture of two distributions with these joint supports. So we have P1 here, this is the support of P1, and then P2 is up here, and this is the support of P2. And let's say that we have a mixture of these two with weights with weight pi. So we have pi, pi P1, and one minus pi P2. Uh, 
Now, if you look at what is the true data score, uh, you'll see that in here, the score is just going to be the gradient of P1, log P1, and see that it does not depend on pi. Because if when you take the log, uh, you get log pi, which is a constant with respect to x, and so that disappears. And if you look at the gradient in here, again, it's just going to depend on P2, but it does not depend on pi. And so what this means is that uh, if you just look at the scores, basically you don't have enough information to recover the weighting of the two, of the two mixtures. And uh, in practice, basically, this is a, this is a failure mode of, of Langevin dynamics is that um, if, if the density is not supported over the whole space, uh, basically Langevin dynamics will not be able to go from one mode to the other. And so you basically are not going to be able to recover the right mixing coefficients. And in That's theory, the you know, if there is a... Can I insert yeah. a comment? So if you actually estimated sure. the using something like Gaussian mixture model or, or k-means, and then of course the weights of the of the, the components is going to depend on the data uh, because the day the, the, the modes are, so here you actually assume that somebody gave you the, the weights a priori and are not trainable oh i i'm just i i just this is a failure mode so i'm just saying that if yeah, yeah. Uh, let's say so i'm just saying that uh, I'm not even assuming I know pi. What I'm saying is that if somehow I'm even able to estimate the gradient here and I'm estimating the gradient here using data or whatever, somehow there is not enough information there to recover pi. And so I'm not going to be able to recover uh, the true weight of the two densities. Now, what, what, I, what I'm just saying, I'm, I'm adding to this, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just that in practice, we actually do density estimation using some sort of a mixture let's say Gaussian mixture model or something like this. And, and, and this will actually introduce some dependencies on, of the weights of the clusters or the, or the mixtures uh, on the data. Oh, so yeah, yeah. this analysis, it will not be true anymore that the gradient logs are independent of the, the weights. Oh, but, but they, this, is, this, is, uh, this is X, this is at, at the point, right? So that, that's fine, I would say. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's just a comment. <laughs> you don't and, have to follow. Uh, you, you can see it here in practice. Uh, if, you, if you take a bunch of, uh, if this is the data density and you do, if you do IID sampling from this density, you're going to get, because this mode has higher weight than this mode, you're going to get more samples up here. Uh, but sort of like if you do Langevin dynamics, you basically end up oversampling this region. And the reason is that uh, basically uh, it mix very slowly, uh, or at least in our experiment, it didn't mix. It didn't figure out. Uh, it takes too long to go from here to here. And so in practice, what happens is that you end up oversampling this model. Right. And uh, so our solution to, to these issues to make this uh, work in practice is to basically add noise. Uh, the idea is that if you have this issue that the data lies on a manifold, uh, one thing we can do is we can just add a bunch of Gaussian noise to the points so that the distribution becomes supported over the whole space. And indeed, uh, if you take, go back to that example on C410, remember the slice score matching loss was very, very uh, unstable. Uh, but if you add a tiny bit of a Gaussian noise to your data, then the learning becomes much, much smoother and nicer. And uh, recall the other problem we had was that we were getting no signal from low data density regions about what's kind of like the right direction we should move to get to the, to, to the high density ones. Uh, if you think about what happens if you perturb your data by uh, adding a lot of Gaussian noise, uh, then uh, uh, what's going to happen is that you're going to reach kind of like uh, you're sort of like going to explore the whole space. And so by adding noise, uh, we're able to uh, get some signal about what's the right thing to do, even when we are far away from the, from the high density regions. Uh, of course, the problem 
with adding Gaussian noise or any kind of noise is that uh, if you add too much of it, uh, you're going to kind of like destruct the structure of the of the of the of the distribution that you're trying to sample for. And so one thing you can do is you can consider uh, uh, multiple noise levels, uh, sigma one, sigma two, sigma L. And the idea is that we can kind of try to estimate the scores of all the data densities perturbed uh, at all noise levels at the same time. And so we can then use kind of like the information contained by the vector field of scores of this density, this density, this density, and this density all at the same time to eventually try to sample that looks, try to sample from something that looks like this, and kind of like use the information from this other picture sort of like to figure out how to do that. And uh, so that's kind of like the, the idea, the idea is that we're going to use uh, some annealed uh, Langevin dynamics to do that. Uh, we can estimate the vector field of scores corresponding to a data density perturbed by a lot of noise. And we can run Langevin dynamics on that. Now that will work reasonably well because it, there's a lot of noise and well supported, uh, but uh, it's not the distribution we wanted to, to sample from, right? We're adding too much noise. And so what we do is we consider now a distribution with a little bit less noise. We initialize Langevin dynamics with the particles from the previous uh, iteration, and we run it for a little bit more. And then we consider another uh, noise level, even smaller, this is very close to the data density we wanted to sample from at the beginning. And we run another Langevin dynamics uh, using, again, initializing it with particle from the previous iteration. And uh, this is kind of like what happens. Uh, oops. If you go in that simple example, if you run vanilla Langevin dynamics, this is what you get. Kind of like you oversample this mode. You sample it too frequently compared to that. And if you do the annealed version, uh, you see that uh, what will happen eventually is that uh, it will use the, the, the initial kind of like phases when it's easy to mix, to kind of like figure out what is the right weighting between the two modes. And eventually you'll end up uh, with many more particles up here uh, compared to down here, which is what you want. And uh, yeah. Now, uh, what we need to do now is we need to be able to estimate uh, these scores for many noise levels, uh, which can be expensive. Uh, for every noise level, there's gonna be a different underlying vector field of scores, and we need to estimate all of them to run our Langevin dynamics. And so what we do is we sort of like use a single uh, neural network to estimate all these scores. Uh, so we basically just use an extra input, which is sigma, uh, which is the noise intensity. And this model will try to estimate given x and given sigma. At any point, it will try to come up with an estimate for the, uh, for the underlying gradient for the data density perturbed with that amount of noise sigma. And uh, the advantage is that it's, much, it's practically more uh, it, it's something that you can use in practice because even if you have a lot of noise levels, you have a single model. And so it's, uh, it's uh, uh, much more convenient and it's gonna use a lot less memory to train. And uh, now this is how it works, uh, this, this final thing, how it works on, on some real world data sets. Uh, and is the CIFAR some uh, faces. And so here you see uh, what happens when we run the annual Langevin dynamics. So here what's going on is that we start with some, well, just white noise, and then we run our Langevin dynamics, our annual Langevin dynamics to try to progressively uh, get closer to the, to the data manifold. And as you see, uh, it's uh, learning to produce pretty good samples. Uh, even though we start with Gaussian noise, it's able to uh, kind of like following these gradients, it's able to change them and turn them into something that looks like the uh, data that we've been using to train the models, which is which is pretty uh, encouraging. 
Uh, indeed, uh, the samples that we got, they are, uh, they look good uh, qualitatively. Uh, quantitatively, we can try to use this kind of like, metrics that people have been using for GANs, like inception and FID scores. And uh, when we published this uh, new ribs, uh, last new ribs uh, on CIFAR 10, for example, uh, we, we, we got something that was, um, I think, better than all the GANs we tried in terms of like inception scores, so 8.91. Uh, which is pretty close to kind of like the numbers that you get uh, using GANs in a class conditional model. Uh, in the past, there was like 9.22, and so we're pretty close to the conditional uh, numbers, even though we train an unconditional model where we don't assume we don't know anything about the class structure. In terms of FID, it's, it's worse than some existing models, but it's doing reasonably well. Um, compared to, to other GANs. So it's, it's pretty exciting because uh, we're able to get the results comparable to, to GANs, even though this is sort of like the first, uh, our first attempt at it and uh, we didn't put a whole lot of engineering into coming up with the right network architectures and, uh, and so forth. So this, this was quite encouraged. Uh, because, uh, you know, unlike GANs, this is a, this is a principle you know, like statistical objective that we can evaluate, we can do model comparison, and so it has a lot of the advantages of let's say, maximum likelihood, but it produces samples that are comparable, in this case, even slightly better uh, than what you can get using generative adversarial networks. Uh, now, you might be worried that the model is, uh, is kind of like overfitting and it's kind of like just remembering the training set. So we did some experiments to test this by doing some nearest neighbor search. Uh, so here, what we do is we take um, uh, what we do is uh, we take a sample produced by the model and then we take the nearest neighbors in the training set. This is in pixel space. So you see a sample, the nearest neighbors uh, in the training set, we don't find quite that plane in the, in the training set, which hopefully indicates that the sample that the model produced was not something that it memorized from the training set and just reproduced, but it's something different. And if you try another one, this, this blue car, well, there's not quite an identical car in the training set. So somehow the model is able to generalize and produce something new. Uh, maybe, you know, you might be worried that, well, we're doing comparisons in pixel space. It's not quite the right thing to do. So we also did comparisons in, in a feature space of a pre-trained model, of, of a, a pre-trained classifier. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the distance that we use is a little bit more, um, it's a little bit better than, than pixel space. So this is the same experiment as before. Uh, we take our sample and we look at the nearest neighbors in the training set using these uh, features learned by a pre-trained model. And again, we see that it looks like the model, the model is not memorizing and the samples are not uh, just uh, uh, something that, that is already available in the trainings. And uh, uh, we can also we also did some in painting experiments. This is a, these are a little, little bit heuristics because it doesn't quite give you a, a way to do in painting directly, but sort of like heuristically, we wanted to see what happens if you try to fill, uh, take an image, uh, you remove the, let's say the right half and you try to fill it in using your model of the, of the, of the distribution over, over X. Uh, this, is, this was the true image and these are the samples that we produce. So you see that there is, again, some variety, which is sort of like indicating that the model is not just memorizing stuff. Uh, if you take this uh, phase, uh, again, you try to complete it, you see that the model is producing uh, right completions that are not quite the ones in the training set. So again, this is sort of like an indication that the model is able to, to generalize to some extent. Uh, all right. And you see more examples of this here. Uh, all right, questions on this? Maybe I'll go back to this. Show you one more. But I really like this animation. Questions on the on these experiments? So I wonder what happened if you try to extrapolate not in the left right but the bottom up or 
talk of the faces or something like this. I mean, it worked the same. We haven't tried, uh, so I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it would work, but, but redundancy there. But uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, in the car, maybe you see. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is a little bit heuristic because it, it, there is not quite a principled way of doing in painting with one of these gradients. So, uh, <laughs> just as a caveat. Uh, and also, uh, during your annealing procedure, do, do you see something like a phase transition? I mean, a place where suddenly the, the features appear mm -hmm. and before that it's still very noisy? Uh, not really. Um, I think you can see it here, I guess, if we go back to this animation. I think it's kind of like smoothly, kind of like appearing. I, I don't notice a particular phase transition here. No, I mean, I, we haven't seen it, but when you, when you move from complete noise to, to the, 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 there was a big jump suddenly. So this looks like an intermediate phase, but it's a, I, I wonder if you see any jumps in the, in the precision uh, in, in terms of the noise level. Uh, is there, is there some critical resolution which appears at a certain length scale? Oh, uh, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think that the student did all the experiments, so I, I, I haven't tried it myself, so I don't know. I mean, I, I don't see uh, that. That's a, good, that's a good question. I think maybe there's something happening at kind of like the average pairwise distance between data points or something. Where, no, we, we know that we to figure out right. which which one. Other questions? I have one. Um, so, if you're let's say you have some image where you know that there's been some Gaussian noise added to it, uh, could your model do denoising? Yeah, yeah, you can do denoising. Actually, works quite well. Uh, there is this connection between denoising and score matching. There's a paper by Joshua Banjo, um, group lab, um, that develops this whole connection. And so, yeah, you can use it for denoising. So, in some sense, the gradient kind of like gives you the direction that you need to move to, to go back to the, to the data manifold, and you can kind of like follow the gradient to, to, to denoise the, the image. Cool. It works quite well for denoise. Yeah. Other questions? All right, so maybe I'll, I'll spend the last few minutes to talk about uh, generalization, uh, which is something I've been, uh, it's, I think it's an interesting question I've been thinking about. Now I've shown you a bunch of pictures, but uh, you know, are, are these results really any good? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's evaluation of these of this generative models is actually a pretty, pretty challenging question. And uh, even understanding what generalization means for these models, I think is, is, is quite tricky. And uh, it's kind of like, as, as a toy example, you can imagine, let's say that you have a, a data set and we're not doing MNIST or C410 or anything, but let's say that we have a data set of cars and in the data set, we know we have the cars and, and buses and we only have, we have red cars, we have blue cars and we have red buses. And now you can see you, you train your, your, your generative model and it can be again, or it can be our, our um, score matching thing or whatever your favorite generative model is. Then you can produce a bunch of samples from it, just like I did in the previous experiments. And then you can, you can ask your question, will the model generate uh, a blue bus? Right? It has seen red cars, blue cars, and red buses. And the question is, will it generalize? And will produce uh, a blue bus, right? And and uh, now this is kind of like a thought experiment. You can consider a more uh, realistic, practical instantiation of this experiment. Uh, you can take the the clever data set, which is kind of like this data set where you have objects of different shapes and colors, and synthetic the images that look like this. And you can construct a data set where all the images have two objects. They have different shapes, different colors, different positions, but every image in the training set is exactly two objects. Maybe it has a cube and a cylinder or um, different colors, maybe a sphere and a cube, 
in different colors, different positions, right? But every image is two objects. And then you train your favorite generative model on this data set. You can generate as many as you want, so you don't have that, that, that issue about uh, limited data. It's synthetic. You can generate as many as much training data as you want. You train a generative model, and then you produce samples. And uh, the question is, will the sample look like A? So every image is two object, like the training set. Or will the model generalize and will it produce uh, images with, let's say, two up, with both two objects, but also three, maybe one object? Right? Uh, it's not even clear to me what is the, what is the right answer. Uh, should the model only produce images with two objects, or should it generalize and produce uh, something with different kinds of objects? Uh, how many think it's the answer? If you say take a GAN or a VAE, it turns out it doesn't matter too much. Will produce is the answer A or B? Anyone right. want to take uh, an assumptions? Uh, assumptions underneath the model. I mean, exactly. Yeah. So the, but, it's not it's not a well-defined problem. So if you actually object models and then you allow this number of objects to vary in your model, I mean, in principle, it, so then it will be B. Oh, the, 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 why should the model is fixed? It has to because 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 uh, we know that there is not enough data to come up with a density. You know there is like a doubly exponential number of densities, and, and you only get a small number of data points. So you have to extrapolate. You have to generalize. So it's all in the inductive bias. I agree. But what is the bias that we're putting in into one of these neural networks, a GAN or a, or a BAE or a, or a Core magic, right? uh, what's the what will happen? I think it's a well-defined problem. You can take a big GAN or you can take a GAN, whatever is the model class that you're using, and you can train it on this data set and you can see whether you get A or B. And that the result will depend on what's the inductive bias. And uh, I think it's an interesting question. And it turns out that the, the answer is B. Uh, we will generalize and we will produce images uh, with a very number of objects, uh, which is uh, somewhat surprising. And, and you can kind of like uh, think of this as well, we can try to project kind of like the images along a dimension that is uh, semantically meaningful to us, like the, the number of objects. And then now we can start to look at generalization along this, let's say, one dimensional feature spaces. So you can imagine a distribution that we uh, were all a training distribution where all the images have exactly two objects. So it's kind of like a delta function of two. Then you can train a model on this training distribution and you can look at what will happen along that dimension. And uh, we did these experiments. This is purely empirical paper. We did the, uh, we tried a lot of generative models and we found that uh, almost all of them, they actually generalize. And they produce so why, why don't they generalize to different shapes for example uh, spheres or, yeah yeah or, I've come to shapes yeah yeah exactly so this was actually inspired by cognitive science this is with some folks in the psychology department and we kind of like looked at what is the what kind of techniques people have used to understand that the the, the, the visual systems of people uh, it's kind of like a black box and, and we can try to use the same kind of yeah, we take inspiration at least from the kind of techniques they've used to understand our cognitive system to try to get a sense of what these models do. Uh, I don't have a good understanding. If I look at the you know, convolutions of these neural networks, I, I don't understand what is the inductive bias that we're putting in. And so this is kind of like an experimental approach to try to get a sense of, of uh, probing this black box and get a sense of what it does. And if you look at numerosity, this is kind of like what you get. Um, it took, we did the experiments in terms of other um, features, like you can look at the paper, we have color, shape, uh, I think maybe I have some slides on that, but still sticking at numerosity, you find some very interesting things, like you can imagine, okay, now what happens if the training distribution, all the, all the images have either two or four objects, right? Um, but that's a well-defined kind of like distribution in this in this feature space. All the images are two or four objects. Uh, and then you can look at what happens for the generated distribution. And it turns out it looks something like this, uh, where the mode of this distribution is actually a three. 
Uh, so th that's pretty surprising, right? Because the model has not seen any uh, image with three objects, but most of the images it produces actually have three objects. So it looks like fitting some sort of an exponential form it the, with few parameters. So in this case, it will be something like a binomial or Gaussian. Or something. So it's, a, it's a log normal, yeah. It's empirically fit. We fitted it pretty well with a log normal. Um, right. Which I think also showed up for whatever reason in some. So, so, so that's, so so you have an inductive bias on some sort of an exponential form on, on the number of objects. Something like that. I'm sure it's hidden somewhere in your in your assumptions. I mean, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to be. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It's just it is not explicit, right? We don't know what the what the bias is, and so. Uh, but I agree. Yeah, yeah. It's there. Uh, but it is surprising, right? Because uh, it's, uh, it's it's producing most of the images of three objects, and it has never seen an image with three objects. And uh, uh, and it, we found similar patterns for we looked at other kind of like meaningful features like color, size, locations. And we found similar sort of like generalization behaviors. And uh, now you can look at multiple features. You can go back to kind of like the original problem and you can say, okay, you know, what if I look at both color and shape at the same time? And I produce a training set where I have spheres which are yellow or red, and then I have cylinders that are just red. And then you can ask, will the model produce a yellow cylinder? Uh, and uh, you know, again, it's, an, it's a question, it's something you can test your model on and you can see what the answer will be. And that will depend on the kind of like inductive bias that you, that you fit into, that you put into the neural network, hyperparameters, whatever learning objective uh, that you fit in. And uh, uh, so we, we explored this in the paper for many, I think we even have like a, if you wanna play with it, a little notebook where you can, play around and generate any training distribution and you can see what the output will be. Uh, and, and to some extent, uh, it, it is, everything is, is, is basically, it has to, you have, there's not enough information in the data to figure out what is the right thing to do, right? Because if you can think about a small number of features, there is kind of like a combinatorial number of combinations, uh, you know, you only get a small, a finite training set. And so there is no way of even figuring out what is the right support of all the feature combinations that are feasible and not. Uh, there's just not enough information. You have to extrapolate and you have to use your inductive bias to decide whether you're going to produce yellow cylinders or not. And so, you know, we know that in the continuous space, uh, unbiased, uh, density estimation, bona fide estimators is impossible. In discrete spaces, kind of like the number of parameters that you would need squares doubly exponential in the number of variables. So it's all about like the, the, the inductive biases that we baked into these models. And, and unfortunately, they're not very explicit at the moment. Uh, if I just show you uh, uh, an architecture and I ask you what is the answer to these questions, I, I wouldn't know how to answer except by doing the experiment. But it's all very opaque. It's all combined and entangled in a complicated way. And so it's, um, I think, it, but it's an important problem to kind of like figure out uh, what, what kind of biases uh, we're putting because we know they're needed and uh, it'd be good, I think, to be explicit to know uh, what kind of generalizations the model will, will, uh, will produce and what they want. And then probably we will need to make this model, you know, use other, They'll be introduce common sense or something. I mean, if you think about will it produce black snow or something that doesn't that doesn't exist, right? How, how does it know, right? It hasn't seen a bunch of images, and how does it know that that does, this black snow doesn't exist? And 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 if it doesn't know anything about the about the world, and so I think we're still pretty far from getting. Uh, I mean, the results that we're getting, I think, are pretty amazing, uh, but I think we need to understand uh, this question a little bit better. Yeah, and I think I think that was about everything I wanted to talk about today. Uh, so I think you know, like I talked about score-based generative models, just to recap, uh, which are quite useful to if you think about energy-based models and uh, working with scores, working with this gradient. I think has some advantage. It's a nice way of thinking about these probabilistic models uh, because uh, it does not require you to do what we're serial training, those kind of unstable minimax procedures. It does not require sampling between training, so it's very scalable. You can use an high-dimensional data set, and it, uh, and, it, and it works. It gives you results 
that are fairly comparable to GANs, um, which is, I think, quite uh, pretty remarkable for a new class of models. It's just often very hard to catch up with the years that went into engineering uh, good architectures for, for GAN, but we were able to get pretty close uh, without too many resources and without too many experiments. Um, are the results good? Well, I guess that was sort of like the last part of the talk. I think evaluation is very hard. It's not even clear what we want these models to do. And I think that we have some metrics, but they're not quite maybe the, the right one because this, this issue of generalization, I think it, it's pretty hard. And uh, that, that's something that uh, uh, kind of like we'll have to think more about, maybe be more explicit about the biases that we're putting into these models. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, we did uh, some empirical experimental study of this, uh, and I think it revealed some interesting patterns, but uh, uh, I know this is a theory, machine learning theory, uh, works in series, and so yeah, definitely interesting questions to get a better understanding from a theoretical point of view of what, uh, of what the bias is about. And, and yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take more questions. Hey, uh, let's thank Stefano again for the very interesting talk. Um, any questions?